Our scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. He's paying taxes to Caesar. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And then he asked them, Whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. This endeth our reading for today. So as we listen to the scripture that was read to us today, I wonder what it is that comes to your mind when you hear it. Now, these short seven verses have been used to preach on a variety of topics, but isn't it odd how that works? How one piece of scripture can be used to preach on so many different things. As I've talked about in the past, and I love the saying that is, you don't read the Bible, the Bible reads you. Meaning, whenever you're reading scripture, it can change what it means to you each and every time you read it. It changes because of how well we are focused when we are reading. And it changes because we read the Bible and interpret it through our own mind. You see, each and every one of us has a framework that we work from when we read, or each and every one of us has an opinion that we form on things, right? Now, I had a, a teacher in high school, and he liked to say that uh, opinions are like armpits. Everyone has a couple, and most of them stink. Now, I don't think that is the case with, with Scripture, how you may interpret it, um, but I think that you might agree that sometimes in a world where everyone's every thought seems to be made public at all times, you've probably heard one or two opinions that have come your way, and you've thought, boy, that one really stinks. But when it comes to this piece of Scripture, I've heard uh, some sermons that were preached upon it, and I thought, yeah, you could go that route. You, you could interpret it this way, but it really means so much more than what I have heard it preached upon. So perhaps you have heard these in the past as well, as this is a very well-known piece of scripture, right? Um, I have heard this scripture used to support the idea that you need to pay your taxes. And I will pause for your booze here. But we should, right? We know this. Uh, we know, I know we don't really like to, but we do have a responsibility to obey the laws that we have set up as a society, right? We have a societal contract with one another. And I get that we can read this and focus on the whole give on to Caesar part as the focus of the sermon. But for me, I find that to be very lacking in the interpretation. Now, I have also heard this scripture used when pastors choose to preach about money that you need to be giving to the church. I will pause for your internal booze at this point. No, I hope not, right? I hope that you remember that part where we're supposed to give with a joyful heart, right? But in this scenario, the sermon usually focuses on that give unto God what is God's part. And you hear, you know, I know you're paying your taxes. Uh, uh, but are you giving to God and the church the money that is supposed to be his? Well, I believe each and every one of you is doing what you know to be right in your hearts. And in this scenario, I'm not going to stand up here and harangue you about your giving. 
But I can see why someone would choose this as the scripture to support that idea. I mean, it lends itself to that very easily, right? Focusing on money, it's an easy connection to make because after all, Jesus uses a coin to make his point here when he is speaking. But again, I find that the interpretation of this scripture uh, to just be about money is very lacking. By far, the worst thing I've ever heard this scripture used for is to support the idea of slavery. Now, of course, this is not something you would hear preached in modern times, right? But this scripture and other scriptures were used by slave owners to remind the slaves that they needed to be subservient to their masters. You know, I don't think Jesus is going to take it too kindly that his words were being used by people to support keeping others in bondage when he came to set us all free. So you can rest assured that I will not be preaching from that standpoint this morning. But all of these things that I talked about, uh, they're really just on the surface of what we can take away from the scripture this morning. So let's start at the beginning of the scripture. What we can infer by reading this scripture is that the Pharisees had been sitting around trying to figure out yet another way to try and trap Jesus into saying something that they could use against him. How many times were they going to try this trick? Right? Over and over again, they try to think up these scenarios to get Jesus to say something that he shouldn't. Now, when I think about the Pharisees, I, I get this image in my head, um, and maybe you do as well. Uh, over and over, scheming and plotting only to fail. I think of the old Roadrunner cartoons. Like the Pharisees are Wiley e. Coyote, and he's coming up with all these crazy schemes to get the Roadrunner, but in the end, the Roadrunner always outsmarts him. Well, the Pharisees were kind of like that too, constantly coming up with schemes to try to trick Jesus, and he was always knowing what they were going after and going right past their trap. Surely you would give up at some point, right? Surely you would stop trying this tact. But no, that is not the case. And if you can say one good thing about the Pharisees, and perhaps this is the only good thing you can say about them, they were persistent. They kept trying. But they must not have been too confident in this particular trap that they were going to set because they don't go themselves to challenge Jesus. They send their disciples to challenge Jesus this time. And when those disciples of the Pharisees go to challenge him, they start their line of questioning with a compliment. Have you ever been in that situation? Somebody is buttering you up and you know something bad's coming anyways. Yeah, people do that, right? So they start out with a compliment. They, they say to him, you know, we know, Jesus, that you are a great teacher. One that teaches everyone in the same manner, putting no one above anyone else. So please, let us ask you a question. And Jesus, of course, sees this for the trap that it is right away. He responds to them, why are you asking me this, you bunch of hypocrites? Now, if you were in this situation, what do you think that you would do? You know someone has an ulterior motive into what they are doing. You know that they're trying to trap you into a situation they can use their advantage. Do you just tell them to go away? Do you give him some glib remark like, why are you asking me this, you bunch of hypocrites? Because there were times when Jesus was biting in his words, especially to the Pharisees. Do you do that? Do you answer the question and let them do with it whatever they may, right? It's not an easy situation to be in, but Jesus doesn't just send them away. He doesn't just call them hypocrites and then tell them to go kick rocks, right? He still tries to teach them in spite of knowing that they don't really want to learn anything from him here. They're just trying to hurt him here. So he does. He goes on to teach them that, yes, you should be doing what is required of you by law. But even more important than that, you should also be doing what God wants you to be doing. And we have the recording that they were amazed by his answer and they went away. 
And I've often wondered what it meant by they were amazed by his answer. Uh, Did it mean that they couldn't believe Jesus figured out the trap that they had tried to set for him? Or did it mean that in their hearts, they were changed by what he had said to them? Well, I tend to believe, or at least I I want to believe or hope, it means their hearts were changed by what he said to them. I I hope that it meant that some of those disciples of the Pharisees stopped following the, the Pharisees and decided to start following Jesus instead. But unfortunately, we don't have a recording of what happened when they went away. But what is it that we should take away from this story? Is it one of those things I mentioned earlier? Well, I don't really think that's where we should focus here. Should we read this scripture and simply say, Ha! Jesus, you really got him there. Way to stick it to the man, Jesus. Well, you know, we could do that. But again, I find that to be lacking of what is most important here. See, for me, when I read this scripture and what I believe we should take away from it is a question. A question for ourselves to ask and to answer. See, I believe we should ask ourselves this question. Am I giving to God what is God's? Now, not just focusing on the money aspect of that, of what you're giving to God. I think we have to ask ourselves and be willing to be honest with ourselves about our answer here. Am I giving to God what is God's? Well, that begs another question. What is God's? The short answer to that one is everything, right? Everything is God's. All that we see before us and all that we cannot see belong to God. So as such, are we giving him what it is he is asking for when he asks for it? Or are we holding on to things and trying to claim them as our own? Are we giving God the worship that he deserves? Not just when we walk into this building on a Sunday, but are we giving him love and praise in all that we do day in and day out? Are we praying? Are we singing songs of worship, even if we're just singing them in our head? Are we singing songs of worship to him? Are we giving God the service that he calls us to? Are we giving of our work joyfully or are we constantly saying to ourselves you know i would love to be more involved but i have so many other things going on in my life are we remembering to give god praise for the wonderful things in our lives when something goes right in your life are you remembering to thank god for it or are you only coming to god when you have a complaint or you have a woe in your life now, do not get me wrong here. I believe God wants you to come with him, to him with your woes so that he can help and comfort you. Now, complaints, that might be a different story. I'll kindly remind you that God is not the head of the complaint department. So I want to tell you a quick story, though, about giving him praise for my own life this week. Now, this week, some of you know already because I'm a bit excited to tell you this story. Um, I was blessed to harvest a deer this week, and I did have a very difficult time finding the deer that I shot. It took many hours of searching to be able to find it, but I was blessed to find it. And I must tell you, the first words that came out of my mouth when I, found, when I saw the deer there were, thank you, God, for helping me find this deer. Now, if you're a hunter, you know the worst feeling in the world is to wound an animal and then not be able to find it. It is a terrible, terrible feeling that you will have. And so I had been sitting in that low of the valley with that all all day as I was searching. But when I found finally found her, I was able to say, thank you, God, for helping me find this deer. And I don't tell you that to brag to you or to say, look at me, I'm so pious, or just to work in my sermon today, the fact that I got a deer this week. That is That was not the goal. I simply wanted to give you an example of where you may find this in your own lives. And again, it's not to look at me, I'm so pious, because believe me, there is much work to be done in my mind, in my heart, to remember to give God the praise for all those good things. It's something I have to work on as well. But I must tell you that I believe 
if we are doing these things with all of our heart, if we are remembering to give God praise and give God what is God's in all that we do, I do believe that that can change the way we see the world. And I believe it can change how we are able to strive through this world in our lives. See, if we are remembering to be focused on giving God what is his in all situations, we will find ourselves in a much better place spiritually, physically, and mentally. So let us commit ourselves to being a people that are constantly remembering to give God what is his, and doing so with a joyful heart. My challenge for you this week is this. No matter what it is that you are facing, remember that all of it is God's. And remember to give it to him and then see how he will carry you through whatever it is you may be facing. Amen.